Hey, you know what's better than one assembly line? Two assembly lines. And welcome back to the channel. Today's the day we crush the ZPM era. Last time we got the fusion reactor, we redid the clean room, and pretty much one shot the Nequada line. Today's episode is all about getting through the ZPM era. And that's going to start with us working towards some crystal processors. And because last episode we unlocked europium, we are finally able to start making these in the autoclave to make these raw crystal chips. These chips are the integral component that makes up the crystal processing tier, the second last tier of circuits in the game. So let's get cracking. But before we do that, let's upgrade power. I cannot be stopped. For the past five episodes, I believe, we have upgraded the turbines over in the right-hand corner. But that just upgrades our generation power, not our storage. So I think it's time that we actually upgrade our storage with these Lapatronic Energy Orb clusters and some Tier 2 capacitors. Think fast, chuckle nuts! Ooh, that was bright, wasn't it? Sorry for that. It's actually Future Chris here coming at you to tell you that we are going to upgrade both power production and that in the recordings, I actually missed out on saying how long it took to upgrade the battery, how much the battery upgrade impacted. So I thought I'd just briefly run you through it now. The battery upgrade went to 108 billion EU per tick storage. And the nitrobenzene setup, the old gas turbines, were going to take two and a half hours to fill it up. And we ran out of nitrobenzene before that happened. So we had to make a quick rush to replace everything with the plasma turbines. And in moving that all around, we actually killed the entire base. We had a full blackout and I had to restart it with a benzene super tank and one gas turbine on an energy acceptor, get the plasma going. It was a whole shit show. So I'm glad that I didn't, I don't have to show you that. It's quite embarrassing, um, and please continue to enjoy the video. I think we can. Ooh, I think we can also start to look at upgrading our power again in terms of generation for the increased efficiency. As the nitro benzene setup is actually starting to take a lot of power with how fast it needs to be, so we can actually be much more efficient with our fuel usage here um, in the large plasma turbine. So I think it might be time to start upgrading to those and doing the math on six plasma turbines. We actually need 168 turbine casings. And this is pretty much our entire buffer of tungsten steel. So we have almost everything set up to upgrade our power to the plasma turbines. And I think this couldn't have come at a better time because our current turbines are chewing through fuel, as we know, and they are going to take over two hours to fill the battery. I'm going to let the battery drain, and then I'm going to replace them with the plasma turbines one at a time so that we actually have at least a little bit of a backup. But currently everything in the base is disconnected so that I can just run this, but we still need to craft. So I'm going to reconnect, craft up the turbine controllers, and start to replace them from there. So we've crafted up everything we require for the plasma turbines. They're a little bit simpler than the other turbines in the fact that they don't need a muffler hatch. So let's take turbine number six as our test and see how much the plasma turbines are going to output. And while in the process of replacing all of our turbines, I decided that it might be time to start beautying up the base a little bit. If we're going to be here for a little bit longer, I feel like we should have a nice crib to do it in. So we've got our new control room here with a larger monitor. I figured I'd put everything on one monitor. We've got our turbines up the top, substation in the middle. We've got the deuterium and tritium, which is used to make the helium plasma. And we have the fusion reactor controller on a screen as well, just so we can see that it's all working and debug any problems. We've got a storage monitor for our helium plasma and our fancy new elevator up to the new turbine maintenance area. And going up, we're greeted by our maintenance lever. That's just for the hatch for the substation. And we have two lines going in. These carry about 16 and a half amps each from the three turbines on either side. And we are using stocking input buses for helium plasma, just so we can increase our TPS and keep it automatically supplied. 
the plasma turbines, we can just check now, they output 183,000 EU per tick, which is 5.6 amps of LUV power. And altogether, all six turbines output 1.1 million. And I'm pretty proud of this room, I'm not gonna lie. I think it really fits the aesthetic as like a maintenance hatch. And nothing beats a facade to cover up a cable. I think that, that just looks so nice. So for us right now, crystal CPUs are actually not that hard to make. We already have access to europium, and because of ore processing, we have a bunch of exquisite emeralds. The first step is the hardest to finish. We've got a 10% chance at getting the raw crystal chip. Thankfully, we can smash the raw crystal chip and get chip parts, and then use more europium and time to get a guaranteed raw crystal chip. So we go from 1 to 9, and then it just goes up. It's multiplicative. Then we need to blast furnace these with helium and an emerald or olivine plate. We're probably just going to use emeralds for this because they're a bit cheaper. And then we get the engraved crystal chip. And then we need to laser engrave this into the crystal CPU. Our laser engraver runs at LUV. So let's start on automating this process here. So step one of the crystal CPU process is to get our initial raw crystal CPUs. And that is going to take so long. At LUV, this recipe has a 70% chance to give us a raw crystal chip. So let's hope that that doesn't take multiple cycles. And thank goodness for that. We actually got one on our first run through. So let's figure out how we're going to automate the process of the production of this. So as brought up earlier, we need to crush these in a forge hammer and then run them through the autoclave again. No way do we get a- no way do we get a second one. Oh my gosh, we got a second one. Okay. So the easy solution here is to have the autoclave output into the forge hammer and the forge hammer output back into the autoclave so that we run these through a cycle. We just have to allow input from the output side. And then this is just going to constantly run through. And it won't be pretty, but I can put a storage bus on the front of this machine here. Actually, let's flip these around. So let's rework this slightly. We'll have the autoclave on this side and the hammer on this side. We'll have the fluid interface on the top and the storage bus can then go on the side, facing each other, allowing from input. Let this recipe run again. Smash it up. Straight back in, and then this will slowly fill up. Every 75 seconds, it goes up by 9. Not worried about that. Pump for import of europium. And storage bus on extract only for the raw crystal chips. So the next step after we've processed our raw crystal chips is to blast furnace them in helium with an emerald plate. So I think because this only takes 45 seconds at high voltage, I think that we can just do this on demand. And then again, this is only 5 seconds in the laser engraver for the crystal CPU. So I think we should be able to do these on demand. No problems at all. <sighs> and we're gonna have to take a detour again. This is Greg Tech. We need the lime lens and the lime dye can only be made from cactus green. So we have to go to the desert to the north. I hate this. And we're here at the desert. Cactus. And we can go home now. And after that little detour with the cactus, we've got our lime lens now. Let's do our first request of an engraved crystal chip. See how long it takes. <laughs> that is ridiculously fast. Okay, so I'm glad I didn't passive that. There's no need. Uh, and let's engrave it with the laser engraver and see. Just take five seconds, done. Okay. So we have our crystal processing unit now. Oop, we need the engraved one for the quest. Let's just request another one and done. Bang. And we have the quest. So now let's start to encode the recipes. We are pretty limited right now because each crystal chip takes 75 seconds to make. It still takes nano CPUs, which is a little upsetting, but everything else here is totally fine. Crystal ones. Yep. We make these no problem. 
And the final ZPM. Again, not an issue for us at this point in the game. Let's go to our circuit assembler. We can now take out these recipes here and place in our new circuits. And theoretically, once we create... <laughs> we're pretty well into the second last tier of circuits in the game. The yellow circuits to the blue circuits was much easier than the move from the green circuits onto the blue circuits. And now the blue to the red is going to be even harder. I think I'm going to temper my expectations for today, actually. We're not going to smash through the ZPM age. This is going to take far too long for the limited time I have left. So what I think we'll do is we're going to work on the dielectric PCB coolant. Uh, and then probably go for the research station, which will require some more ZPM infrastructure. But I think that that's going to be a good goal for this episode is at least trying to get the first UV circuit. I think that's doable. So let's find out. Dielectric PCB coolant is very simple. Just takes three steps. First step is biphenyl dust with oxygen and benzene. Second step is polychlorinated biphenyl which is biphenyl and chlorine. And the final step is mixing with distilled water. All right, and it's as simple as that. Let's see if this is working. So this is our biphenyl reactor. And success, polyphenyl has been made. Now let's make polychlorinated biphenyl. And perfect, distilled water and PCB to make our PCB coolant. The quest book seems to think that dielectric PCB isn't actually used in much stuff. So I'm happy to leave it at high voltage for now. I'll upgrade it later if we need to, but for now I think just buffering a little bit of it will do. Let me tell you a story about another Greg Tech rabbit hole I just went down. So as you just saw, we finished up a dielectric PCB coolant. And for all intents and purposes, I planned on making the research station and the high performance computing array. Now I see two quests leading into this and go, ah, oh, easy, of course, so easy. We just need to make trinium coils. I have all these materials. I make enriched naquata, trinium, and regular naquata. Until I look down and see the ZPM, which means that I need a ZPM assembler. And this is the same recipe as every other assembler on the planet. Two robot arms, two conveyors, and the, and the tier of circuit. But every single one of these, again, it's an assembly line recipe, but the ZPM takes more time because when I request it multiple times, it gets stuck here with this half stack of European wire in comparison to the LUV, which was a single full stack. I can't request multiple because this will fill up and then overflow. It ends up with me having to request ZPM motors one by one. If there's a better way, please tell me because I'm, I'm sick of it. This is absolutely terrible. We need 10 motors three for each robot arm, two for each conveyor. But here we are. We've got our ZPM assembling machine. So we've set the recipes now. We need 42 trinium coil blocks to upgrade all three of the blast furnaces we need to. And that's why we set up the Nequita line early. And the first set of coils have come off the production line. Let's go upgrade the blast furnace. And that's one more milestone to check off our list. Those trinium coils have allowed us to get Nequadria. So we finally have the complete Nequadria chain. All right, but enough of the distractions. Let's get back on track. I've added in some patterns for the ZPM superconductor, and it's time to just send a request. Let's get 100. I reckon this will take a little bit of time and start to put some nice stress on our power system. So mixing it takes 8 seconds and smelting 13. So I'm here in our newly redecorated assembly hall to give you a brief explanation of what we're doing now because I think it's really useful to know how Greg Tech has actually evolved. As we've gone through previously, we need these data access hatches on the ends of our assembly lines to properly run the recipes. Originally in Greg Tech, the assembly line didn't need research. You could just put the items in and it would run. However, in 1.12, or at least in the more recent versions of Greg Tech Community Pack on 1.12, research has been added. And that's pretty much the main gate into the UV circuit and the fusion reactor tier 2, even the fusion reactor tier 1. There are three components that we need for this journey. 
we need a data bank, a research station, and a high performance computing array. A data bank is pretty simple. It's just a spot to store all of your recipes. In brief, it's just a data access hatch, but with more storage and can read data orbs. This little structure here is gonna be what's taking us through the next age. We can change out the back with data access hatches. So I'm gonna end the episode once we get to the UV circuit. And if we work back, we need the HPCA, which requires the research station. We look in the recipe here, we actually need to research a data orb with 16 computer working units per tick, and it'll take 64,000 total. What the HPCA does is provides computer working units per tick on this side here of the multi-block. You can run the HPCA in multiple configurations. This nine block area here is the area where we put the components. And we can flick through here and see a bunch of different ones, but really it's completely up to you how you want to make it. 16 computer working units per tick is going to require four HPCA computation components. And these are, I guess, relatively expensive, but here's our dielectric PCB coolant coming into play. And then four of these is going to require eight cooling. And now if we look at the passive coolers, they provide one and the active coolers provide two. So the configuration we're going to use is we're going to use four HPCA computation components that'll provide 16 CWU per tick. And then we are going to use four active coolers, which will provide eight cooling and will consume 32 liters per tick of our PCB coolant. Honestly, not too bad. And it's only going to be used when we are requiring research. And research is only done when you need a new recipe. So as we can see, there are 27 different research steps, but for our sake, we're actually not going to need that many. The ZPM components that require research are about four and some of the larger ones, this UV circuit is only 16. Same with the next battery that we're gonna do. So we're only gonna need that, but here we've got space for two of them. And hopefully in future, we can require less cooling by using the more advanced components. But I think for now, let's get the data bank down and continue to work on our research station. So we've finished the data bank. And one of the things that we needed to change about our assembly lines is over on the other one, we have our data access hatch, which can read data sticks. And on our closest one, we actually have an optical data reception hatch. And these are connected with optical fiber cables, which are borosilicate glass, silver, and PTFE. And now this is just connected to our data bank here. And this cable just comes from the data bank and lets the assembly line read the contents of the data bank. And behind we have our wall, our nine configurable blocks, and we just have three data access hatches with our ZPM components in them. And we'll fill this up with data orbs as well. So one of our assembly lines can be for LUV components or ZPM, doesn't matter. And the other one will be able to read data orb. And the plan for this room is to have a second data bank on the left hand side, two high performance computing arrays and the research station in the middle. And so since then, I've been working very tirelessly on figuring out how I can properly automate the assembly lines. And as you can see with the ME interfaces that are on the front, I have figured it out with a little help from an old friend. So effectively, the P2P tunnels are what we use to automate the assembly line. And how we do this is quite simple. But first, I just want to walk in here and let you listen to the sound that I've been putting up with. This is a horrible noise. No more. So how we used to automate the assembly line is we would use a advanced buffer. We would buffer everything in and then we would suck them out using GregTech components. And this limited us to only running one recipe at a time because you can't prioritize or filter without running recipe conflicts and such. Since then, what we do now is we use a dual interface to send the items into an item P2P with blocking mode enabled on the interface. The item P2P has two outputs. One of them is up on the front input bus to read the contents to make sure no more items get sent in. And the second connects to item pipes, which connect to all of the buses. This means that now I could request 64 LUV motors and run into no problems because 
only one set of recipe items can be put into the P2P at a time because of blocking mode. I've also done this for the second assembly line as well. So now there should be no issues in just mass requesting components from the assembly line. Thank goodness for that. Because looking at the research station, we need eight LUV sensors, which is eight motors. The HPCA takes eight LUV field generators, which take two emitters each, so two motors. It would just be a nightmare. And this, has signif this is gonna save us a significant amount of time. So component number two of three is constructed now. We have our research station up and running. This is effectively just a giant scanner. It runs at LUV and all we have to do is place a data orb and the object in the object holder. It scans it and it uses the work from the HPCA to research it. So next step is the HPCA. And with not one, but two shiny brand new ultra voltage circuits, we can call the episode there. We spent the entirety of this episode working within this room to craft up a research station, data bank, and HPCA. We're officially into the digital age of Greg Tech now, and we're on those final legs towards the end. Next episode, we're going to work on more batteries, more fusion, and more circuits. The usual Greg Tech trio. We take a look again at our milestones chapter. We can see we're on the final stretch here. We have one more tier of circuit to go, two fusion products, and three batteries. We are just so close. But with that all being said, thank you for watching. If you like the series, make sure to subscribe. We're almost there. It's going to get real fun in the next few episodes. And if that's what you're about, then I'll see you next time. Bye!